It's true of just about anything worthwhile that a person could do with his life, that when he begins it, he does not know what he's asking. He may have more or less definite ideas about what it will be like, how it will go, how it will go poorly, how it could go catastrophically, or how, alternately, things could go wonderfully, beyond his wildest expectations, as much as he has pictured those, too, in his mind. So note how Jesus speaks with James and John, who were honest enough to express their desires, the desires for a life of great meaning, of purpose, of fire, a life of red, suitable for James's day, who would shed his blood for the Lord's word, a life filled with the Holy Spirit with all the turmoil and joy that that contains. Jesus does not respond to James and John, who were brave enough to say what I think everyone was thinking, because you notice when the James and John came back, everyone else was a little jealous. <laughs> everyone else was incensed that they had said these things and that Jesus had taught them specially. And up to that point, among the disciples, they were drawing on things that they could have imagined, and especially things characteristic of them, James and John, the sons of thunder, putting themselves forward before everyone else. But we have not come here today to celebrate things that we could plan, or that seem probable, or that we have imagined, nor are we celebrating or trying to bless or ask a blessing for anything that Sawyer has already prepared in his life or imagined. All of those things are wonderful. Planning is helpful. He is well prepared to serve you here. The planning and imagination, all of that has to do with probabilities, things that could happen or not. And I hope that if this year has taught the church anything, it's that probabilities are absurd. And our imagination of how things will go, or what things will be, or how the Lord's harvest will happen, what will grow and fall away, and what will instead, in the midst of hardship and drought, bear thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold, nobody has any idea. None of us really knows, finally, when it concerns anything important in life, including our own deaths, what it is that we ask. So we come before this gospel reading and this Lord who speaks not in probabilities, but in certainties. We come before him with James and with Pastor Myers. We come before it with all of us together with humility. Knowing that what lies before us will not depend on our planning, even when we plan. Will not depend on what we have thought will occur, even though we have gained that out, probably. It will all depend on the Lord's certainty not on our plans. So what are those? What does he promise? And how does he deal with his disciples when they are certain of some things they don't know and certain of other things that they have yet to find out at all? The first certainty that the Lord's servant has is this, that the Lord desires to bless him with the very same things that the Lord himself undergoes. Let's say it this way, because Jesus does in another place. It is enough for your whole life, your whole ministry, however long that lasts, if Jesus comes back tomorrow morning before your Sunday service. It is enough for your whole life and ministry that you should be like your master. That's enough. You don't have to do more than that or less than that. It is enough that you should be like him. Listen to what he says. Jesus said to them, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink? the cup that I drink, or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized. What is he talking about? He's not talking about something in the past, his baptism by John or something like that. He's talking about what is yet to come, what will be hard, what is unknown, a kind of country you've never been to before. He knows the outline of that. He knows that it includes death. He does not yet tell James, who died on this day, who is commemorated on this day, that his life also involved a death in his service. And John, strange to say, will live into old age. 
Nobody knows any of that yet, and Jesus doesn't tell it all to them. But he says, when I look into the future as one who is faithful to the Lord's word, when beautiful Savior looks into the future as a congregation gathered under and governed by only the Lord's word, what do we know will happen in a world that does not accept that word? In a world which in fact grows more openly hostile to that word? You see the honesty of James and John. Jesus is asking them if they are willing to suffer as he does. Not, of course, for the sins of the world. Only he can do that. But he is asking, will you come with me? You don't know how long that road will be. You don't know how hard that road will be. You do not know what nice, easy patches of road you'll find, and it'll seem like everything is good. You don't know how many fat years and how many lean years, but I want you to come with me. That's what I am calling you to. The yoke that is put on the Lord's servant, as it will be in a few minutes, is a yoke just move in the same direction with me, James, John, Sawyer. That's all. Are you willing? Because it's going to be hard. Are you willing? They say, yes. And maybe we snicker a little bit, as I just did involuntarily, when you hear that, because you know that when someone says that he's ready to go, you're happy he's ready to go, and you're not sure he knows what it means to be ready to go. They say, yes. And Jesus doesn't say, well, you'll say no later on when you know more. He encourages them. The cup that I drink, you will drink. That will be part of it. Because it is my cup of sorrow, because it is my cup of woe, because it is my cup, it will be a blessing to you. No poison will be in the cup which your physician sends you. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. You will be washed by suffering. Maybe of blood. I don't know. I don't know anything about what's going to happen in the next week anymore. So I'm not going to predict anything, much less from a pulpit. You will be with him. And then he says this, But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. And this is enough especially for you to think of your calling in the Lord as your calling, not as someone else's, for you to be jealous of him, not as yours, amazingly, for him to be jealous of you. Your calling is yours. Your service is yours. That's what you set your head to. That's what you set your mind to. And you pull in that direction where Jesus has put you. And that will be enough for you. When you have done all, say, I am an unprofitable servant and enjoy his mercies. That's going to be plenty for anybody, anywhere, anytime. And he wants to give that to you, and that is a certain thing. He will. It will come. Nobody knows the shape of it, but it will come. And it will be a blessing to you because he disciplines his sons. He loves you, his son. And he will discipline you, and you will change, and it will be wonderful for everyone. But there is another certainty, far more beautiful than this, because it's founded on the gospel itself. You heard it at the very end of the gospel reading. Listen to it again. It shall not be so among you, lording it over, worrying about power and control, and what people like, and what people don't like, and how many votes. That's not your concern. Don't worry about it. Jesus won't ask you about how many votes or how much power you had or who took the rust off the cabinet in your office, whether it was you or somebody you got to do it. It doesn't matter. Not at all. There's a little bit of rust on one of the filing cabinets. <laughs> That's true. I'm not speculating. I saw it. But he says this, It shall not be so among you, obsessed with power. It shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. Not with the anxiety that maybe a slave has, but because you are a slave of Christ, you are a slave of anyone who needs the gospel, anyone for whom Christ died. Some of them are gathered here. Most of them will probably be back tomorrow. I'll be back tomorrow. We'll be gathered here to hear that word. 
You are always certain. There's no other option. Temptations to power certainly come. They come thick and fast sometimes, especially if you're halfway decent at your job. But that's not you, and that's not what you need to focus on. Because this is a beautiful place as I drove in today, but I don't know how many of the houses that I saw just on Davidson Road, how many of them are in the Lord's Word on Sunday. I don't know how many of them farther south than, than I got, because I turned in here, or east or west of Davidson Road. I don't know how many of them are in the Lord's Word on a day-by-day -day basis. That's going to be enough. So let's make it less abstract. First, you don't need to be slave of everyone, potentially, certainly not, opinion from around the Missouri Synod articulated on social media. Who cares? You need to be slave of the lost in Olive Branch. You need to be slave of beautiful Savior. You need to be slave of the gospel and of building your family up in that gospel, not by any means neglecting them. They're church members too. Be a slave to those folks and you will have more than enough. You'll have plenty of furrows to walk down as the Lord's ox. Because you know that Jesus asked this of his servant, of all of his servants, because this is how it is with him. Temptations of power came thick and fast as soon as his ministry began. As soon as he announced publicly that he would be the Lord's servant, he was taken out into the wilderness by one who wanted that to stop, by someone who wanted to make sure that that ministry was utterly unfruitful, that he did not accomplish a single one of his purposes, and then finally sold out his soul and everyone else's for the sake of power. But he was not deterred. Despite his hunger, despite his loneliness, despite the isolation of the wilderness which comes, in the fat years there are many around you and sometimes there are very few and it feels like none at least. But you have the Lord's word. And his word to you and to beautiful Savior and to all of branch is this. For even the Son of Man came not to be served. He does not need anything from you much less your plans or your imaginations about how well or poorly this or that may go in the future. He came not to be served, but to serve you, to serve Sawyer, to serve beautiful Savior, to serve Olive Branch. Jesus already thinks far more about all the lost in Olive Branch than maybe anybody in this room, but let's just say everybody in this room. They are on his heart. For them, his blood was shed. Because when he calls you into his service, the reason we do red, even if it's not James' day, is because everything about his service is about that blood. Everything about his service is about that ransom. A ransom that you know, a ransom by which you are free. But many do not know. Many are unsure. Many have no idea where to turn for any kind of certainty. Their plans have collapsed. They don't know what's coming next week in every realm of their life. Give them Jesus. Give them his blood. Give them what comes from his cross over and over and over again in the word, in baptism, in communion. Give them what they need. Give them all they need. And for you and for them, that will be enough to know the master and his ransom and his blood. To him is all glory now and forever. Amen. Amen.